Today I'll be talking about the Radiohead Iceberg. If you haven't seen an Iceberg video before, Somehow. then I'll quickly go over the concept with you. Essentially it's a video genre based off of the Iceberg image format that goes over a list of various talking points in relation to a specific subject. Starting off with the most well-known and progressively descending into complete obscurity. The specific iceberg we'll be covering in this video is one I made which compiles a variety of icebergs created by these guys on Reddit and this guy on Twitter. I like to call it the most gigantic frosty iceberg of all time. I'd like to give a huge shout out to all the aforementioned users for helping in making this video possible, as well as websites like Citizen Insane, Addies, Green Plastic, and the Radiohead subreddit for providing information while researching. Now with all that being said, I think it's about time we get into this very stuff. Creep is Radiohead's debut single that was initially released in 1992 but would eventually see worldwide acclaim the following year later. It's mainly identifiable through its shamelessly self-deprecating lyricism and blasts of guitar crunch that segue into the chorus. Whether you like it or not, it's without a doubt Radiohead's definitively most popular song, well above and beyond the rest of the band's discography in terms of widespread popularity, and I believe that merits it its own designated spot right above this iceberg. Having a worldwide praised and beloved hit song is probably the dream for just about every up and coming artist out there, but Radiohead's experience with the sudden fame from Creep proves just about how bullshit that fantasy truly can be. Before and even shortly after its release, nobody in the band was expecting even a fraction of the amount of recognition the song would receive. Well, except for Johnny, I guess. Eventually the song would become a hit in Israel, followed by being a minor hit for college radio stations in the US, up until the song would explode in popularity in 1993 due to it being reissued to accompany Pablo Honey. Throughout the next two years, the band was consistently watching audience members come and go just to hear Creep while neglecting the rest of their material. Ed O'Brien described the experience as living out the same four and a half minutes of our lives over and over again. Radiohead were very vocal about their disdain for the song due to these experiences, even going as far as to write songs directly about it which we'll be going into in a bit. Eventually this animosity would reach its ultimate climax during the OK Computer Tour, when Tom started publicly lashing out at people suggesting the song, telling them to frick off, and even going as far to describe them as <laughs> dumb. Eventually the song would slowly fizzle out from live sets, only being played occasionally afterwards a few times in 2009 and 2016. Although, not everyone in the band was quite fond of having to play through the song again. High and Dry, Fake Plastic Trees, Karma Police, and No Surprises are a few more of the band's biggest singles. The former two can be found on the band's sophomore album, The Benz, while OK Computer is home for the latter. Although not as massive as Creep was, they're still pretty successful songs on their own right, and unlike Creep, the band wouldn't go on to resent these songs later on in their career as they're still being played live regularly. Well, except for High and Dry, which is pretty much just Creep light at this point. Any music enthusiast out there has likely seen at least one of these three albums spring to their notice at one point during their time. I think it's safe to say that if you're even watching this video you've had to have at least heard one of these all the way through. Not only are they incredibly acclaimed and popular albums from the band, but also of rock music in general, with OK Computer mostly being shown off as the band's landmark project. The recording sessions for Kid A boasted a plethora of songs that wouldn't make it onto its titular album, so in the following year of Kid A's release, Radiohead dropped Amnesiac, which consisted of 11 more songs from the very same sessions. Some people are quick to write this release off as a B-sides compilation due to this fact, but the band itself and many others see the album standing well on its own, as it provides an entirely unique, more jazz-influenced atmosphere which separates it from its sister album. In fact, there was even talk to bundle the two albums together as a double album, but due to a Happy Meal promotion they had to split it up in two. Although with the anniversary release of Kid Amnesia in 2021, we can get a glimpse on what the double album experience would have been like. 
Tom York, born on October 7, 1968, is the lead frontman of Radiohead since their formation back in 1985 all the way up to the present day. On top of being the main songwriter, he also performs vocals, rhythm guitar, keyboards, and sometimes even drums for the band. Aside from Radiohead, he also performs in the bands Adams for Peace and The Smile, as well as boasting a solo career that's currently consisting of three studio albums and a film soundtrack. On top of all of this, he's also had some collaborations with artists such as PJ Harvey, Bjork, Uncle, Sparkle Horse, Mode Skeletor, Flying Lotus, R.E.M., Burial, Fortet, Portishead, and MF Doom, the last of which we'll be getting more into later on in this video. Following the release of Hail to the Thief, the band's record contract ended and Radiohead chose to part ways with EMI and remain as an independent artist, without being confined to the standard process of an album rollout, and especially wary of their albums leaking on the internet. Radiohead decided to experiment with the release of their following album, In Rainbows, and uploaded it onto their own website with a self-explanatory pay-what-you-want model, where you didn't even have to pay at all if you wanted to and would still receive the entire album in mp3 format. This was an insanely bold move for a band as big as Radiohead at the time, and not one that a lot of fellow musicians took lightly. The release seemed really community-oriented, but it wasn't catered towards their musician brothers and sisters, who don't sell as many records as Radiohead. It makes everyone else look bad for not offering their music for whatever, said Sonic Youth bassist Iggy Pop. Although it didn't set a precedent for how major artists would distribute music in the near future, it surely gave us an interesting look in the concept years before websites like Bandcamp would come into the fray. On October 10, 2000, Radiohead released their fourth studio album titled Kid A, which completely strayed from their alternative rock roots into a more electronic and experimental style of sound. This drastic shift in sonic identity was considered pretty controversial at the time, and left many fans divided on how to really take it in. Of course, in retrospect, we all know that turned out to be a good move, which is why on June 27, 2019, YouTuber Middle 8 uploaded a video titled Kid A, The Greatest Left Turn in Music History. That title would go on to be frequently memed on by Radiohead fans because... From the Basement is a series of webcasted live performances run by Nigel Godrick, the producer for Radiohead. It's notable for lacking both a host and an audience, instead focusing strictly on the performing artist with a level of fidelity that resembles a studio recording. The series features a plethora of artists, including Queens of the Stone Age, PJ Harvey, Thundercat, Sonic Youth, a variety of others, and of course, Tom York and the Radioheads. The Radiohead performances took place in 2008 with an episode mostly focused on material from In Rainbows, and in 2011 with an episode focused strictly on King of Limbs material. According to Ed, there were talks for an episode centered around a moon-shaped pool, though it was unfortunately scrapped, likely due to the complications of bringing in a whole-ass orchestra. Up to this point, it's unknown the next time when the band will be locked up in the basement again, though we can only hope that it's soon. These are two bands that emerged in the UK's alternative rock scene shortly after the time OK Computer came out. They were brandished by critics as being Radiohead light due to their usage of falsetto vocals and similar compositional techniques, and for emerging in a time where Radiohead were one of the few mainstream British bands to avoid associating with the Britpop scene. Thus, they were accused of being bandwagoners and imitators, and even up to this day in music circles are often ridiculed for the prevalent Radiohead influence in their sound. Honestly, there's a whole lot of details I'm skipping out on here, because I have plans to do an entire video specifically about this subject, and if it's even worth drawing these comparisons in the first place. So stay tuned for that sometime in the near future. No Times 42 refers to the 11th track off of Hail to the Thief called A Punch Up at the Wedding, aptly subtitled as no, 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 no. In the beginning of the song, Tom can be heard singing the word no over and over again a total of 42 times. When transcribed for various lyric websites online, they would often condense this section down into just no times 42. And given how hilarious that appears, it became a sort of inside joke for Radiohead fans. 
Similarly, also pertaining from Hail to the Thief is the phrase, The Raindrops, times 47, which stems from the second track titled Sit Down Stand Up. This would also become a meme. During a performance of Idiot Tech at the Outside Lands Festival in 2008, Tom wasn't feeling quite up to his tempo and quickly muttered the phrase, Faster Johnny, while singing the lyrics for the song. Although the Outside Lands performance is the clearest example of Tom's craving for velocity in the song, it's far from the only time that it's happened. Another prominent example occurred while playing at Glastonbury in 2003, when Tom repeatedly muttered the word faster in complete desperation throughout the performance. Like with no times 42 and the raindrops times 47, the phrase would also be repeatedly memed upon by Radiohead fans online, and it seems to have just recently come full circle when Johnny set his profile picture on Twitter to a dial being turned up to fast. To finish off this trifecta of Radiohead shitposting, we have the ever elusive Ed. Many fans have speculated that while singing sustained vocals, it sounds like background vocalist Ed O'Brien is singing his own name. It's mainly heard in songs like Karma Police, Weird Fishes, and most prominently the 1996 Live at Pink Pop performance of Lyft. During an Ask Me Anything on r slash IndieHeads to promote his upcoming solo album, Reddit user Rufy11 asked Ed about the whole Ed thing, to which Ed responded by saying he was unaware of it. So although it's practically confirmed at this point that he isn't singing his own name, it's something I still like and to hold as true in my own personal headcanon strictly due to how funny it is to me. I just can never not say Ed when singing along to Weird Fishes. Gotcha, bitches. Creep is nowhere near a bad song, but if you had to listen to it every single day for the better portion of half a decade, I'm sure you would get sick of it at some point too, especially when the song in question sets you up as a miserable loser, to a point where people on death row are sending you letters saying they sympathize with the song. You would want to veer far away from that shit, going past the earlier days when the band was still unsure where the success of Creep was going to take them. I'm sure it's easy for them to come to terms with now that it's just a simple catchy pop song that many people have grown attached to over the years. Hell, they played it way more times than you'd think throughout their last tour. Ed's remarked before that he sees Creep as the standout track to Pablo Honey, and Tom even admitted that it can be cool to play it sometimes, not to mention that awful remix he did of it just recently. I honestly see it as the band being dismissive of Creep for the pressuring attention it brought along with it, not as much for the quality of the song itself. On a Friday is the band name Radiohead initially touted during their formative years at school. The name is an ingenious reference to the date of the week when they would all get together in their band room for rehearsal. For some unknown reason, record label executives prompted the band to change their name upon being signed which actually serves as a good transition to the next topic. The name Radiohead comes from the sixth track of Talking Heads' seventh studio album titled True Stories. In an interview with Q Magazine, Tom said the name sums up all these things about receiving stuff. It's about the way you take information in, the way you respond to the environment you're put in. Though I choose to take that with a grain of salt because I also recall reading somewhere that Tom just thought it was the least shittiest song off that album. Regardless, we were blessed with the moniker that would overthrow the intellectual on a Friday to define the band up until this very day. Yeah, that isn't hyperbole. True Love Waits initially premiered live at a show in Belgium on December 5th, 1995 we wouldn't get an official studio recording of the song until much later on May 11, 2016, with the release of A Moon-Shaped Pool. However, this version differs drastically from the original, featuring a much more heartbroken atmosphere due to the breakup Tom was facing with his partner Rachel at the time. Up until that point, the live and Oslo version from the I Might Be Wrong EP was the only official release of the song, although there were attempts made for a studio recording during the sessions of OK Computer and Kid A and Amnesiac. To 
celebrate the 4th of July in 1993, a British band called Radiohead performed live at the MTV Beach House in the United States. This performance goes down in history as being one of the most batshit insane live shows the band has ever put on. After a brief interview with Ed and Colin, the band puts on a relatively tame performance for the obligatory creep. Which is already funny as hell because I personally can't think of a worse song to put on for a very beach house. But whatever, I guess that isn't the point. What is the point of all this is what comes after. Following frustrations due to performing the songs four times in a row to emulate a multicam shot, and growing tensions between Tom and show host Kennedy, the band spontaneously broke into an unscheduled performance of Anyone Can Play Guitar which slowly morphs its way into a full-blown meltdown. Really, the best way I can describe this performance is that it's like a crescendo of cringe. Things really start to kick in after Tom sings the line about wanting to be Jim Morrison and he ad-libs this. Afterwards, which is then followed by Tom singing, scratch that, screaming the phrase any- at the very tippy top of his lungs. But perhaps the most infamous moment in this entire performance is after Tom finishes his vocals and proceeds to dive head first into the very pool. What's utterly insane about that though is that the odds weren't entirely impossible for Tom to end up very dying from doing that. If this sodden Tom York proceeded to step on any of the wires powering the lights, he would have been electrocuted straight into heaven on a little rowboat as explained by the producer of the show. A lot of credit for this goes to YouTube user ShreddyCat, who not only assisted with the original performance, but later uploaded it to YouTube and answered questions for people who were curious about the entire... event. An iron lung is a life support vessel that encapsulates a person's body to assist with respiration. Radiohead would use this device as an allegory for how they felt about the uncontrollable success of Creep on their song fittingly titled My Iron Lung, which was released as a single for their 1995 sophomore album The Benz. The lyrics reference to how Creep, although providing them with the success to continue as a band, also restricts them in the eyes of public perception and the expectation from record labels to have them continue releasing singles that would overthrow Creep in terms of success. This is made entirely evident with the lines, This is our new song, just like the last one. A total waste of time, my iron lung. Meeting people is easy is a which documents the immense suffering Radiohead faced during the touring for OK Computer. Not only that, however, it even gives us a behind-the-scenes look into various production efforts from the band, including the making for the music video of No Surprises, which if the documentary is anything to go by, didn't come off as an easy feat. What's also notable about the documentary is that it gives us an early look into various songs that weren't available at the time of its release. These songs would be Follow Me Around, I Will, How To Disappear Completely, Life in a Glass House, and also an early attempt at a studio recording for Man of War. If you're ever in the mood to witness rock stars living through pure agony, I honestly cannot recommend this documentary enough. Even if you're just an avid Radiohead fan but are still intrigued by how pressuring it is for bands to market, tour, and promote music, Meeting People is Easy serves as a great insight to that entire world of stardom. B-sides are a collection of songs recorded during studio sessions that don't appear on their respective studio albums. Instead, they're generally released as filler to accompany a single on side B of a 7-inch record, hence the name B-side. Throughout their career, Radiohead would go on to release a plethora of B-sides, some of which would even go on to become beloved fan favorites. These would include Talk Show Host, Lift, Go Slowly, and The Daily Mail. Although, I'm pretty partial to Cut Tooth, it's a super good song. The Kid Amnesia Exhibition is a beautifully glorified walking simulator that features abstract visuals inspired by the various artwork created during the Kid A and Amnesiac period. It was developed by Name the Machine and Arbitrarily Good Productions using Unreal Engine 5. It was also published by Epic Games, meaning if you want to play it on PC or Mac, you'll have to go through their launcher. However, if you're one of the five people in the world right now that own a PS5, you'll be happy to hear that you can play it through that as well. Although technically a video game, it harkens much more to something like LSD Dream Simulator or Yumi Nikki to me, 
where the point isn't really to beat it, but to take your time and experience it instead. There's also even a bunch of stems and alternate versions of various songs that wound up on Kid A and Amnesiac buried deep within the files of the game, but that's something I'll be taking a much deeper look into in a future video. The origins of Just pertain from a heated battle between Tom and Johnny to try and see how many chords they could fit into one song. According to Reddit user Manzi, the song would end up containing a total of 15 different chords, these being A, A sharp, A minor, B, B minor, C, C minor, D, D minor, D sharp, E minor, F, F sharp, G minor, and a diminished C7. Holy shit, what a bunch of dorks. I guess while we're on the topic of Just, we might as well bring up just whatever the hell it was that guy laying down said in the music video. If you don't already know, throughout the video there's a collective of people in business suits surrounding a guy who spontaneously decided to lie on the floor. They're progressively pressuring the guy to explain to them what caused him to lie down, and when he eventually gives in, his dialogue is intentionally left without subtitles leaving it vague to what he actually says. Up to this very day, the band and director Jamie Thraves have refused to tell anyone what the guy says, though Tom did confirm that he at least says something coherent. I do have my own theory on what he says, however. By using elite ancient lip-reading tactics, I was able to decipher that the guy is actually saying Johnny arrived a bit early to the f creep party in the sense that he was never too fond of the song in the first place. In an interview with Chicago Sun-Times, he said that he didn't like the song, it stayed quiet, so in an attempt to sabotage it, he decided to hit the guitar really hard. Unfortunately for him, the guitar crunches would end up becoming a classic part of the song, which resulted in it being a smash hit, and a defining song for the band, then a staple in live shows for many, many agonizing years to come. In certain copies of Kid A on CD, if you pry open the back cover you can find a hidden booklet which contains additional artwork and lyrics from songs written in this era of the band, including some which didn't even wind up on Kid A. I do have a separate script written out about this already. Despite appearing simplistic on the surface, the rhythm for videotape involves much more going on beneath its waters. Sort of like an iceberg, am I right? Essentially, the piano beat is played an eighth note ahead of the rhythm, syncopating the entire song to give it this scattered, jittery feeling, sort of resembling a VHS going absolutely haywire on the tape deck. This is a pretty downplayed explanation of it, as there's far more that I could get into, but this video is already long enough as it is, so I'd like to redirect you to Warren Music's video on it instead, as he does a much better job thoroughly explaining it. Plus, his channel is just very awesome if you ever need any Radiohead tutorials, so go check it out anyways. Despite being played in a standard 4-4 time signature, Pyramid Song contains an unsuspectingly complex rhythmic pattern which alternates between two beats of three, a beat of four, and another two beats of three. If you take the four and make it into a square to represent the bass, and the four beats of three surrounding it to represent triangles, the rhythm of the song forms into the shape of an actual pyramid, hence the name Pyramid Song. Listening In has a really great video that dives deeper into this if that's something you want to check out for yourself. During Prince's performance at Coachella in 2008, he did an 8 minute cover of Creep that deeply resonated with many people. Naturally, this performance would find its way onto YouTube the next day for it to be relived by those who got to see it and shared to those who hadn't had the chance to experience it before. However, Prince wasn't having that. Immediately following its upload, he went full frip and blocked every video of the song from being on the platform. Tom York, in response to this, found the act hysterical, specifically stating, Really? He blocked it? Well, tell him to unblock it. It's our song. Mind you, this is in 2008, a year after the Pay What You Want release of In Rainbows, so you're witnessing two artists with very different perceptions of sharing music on the internet go at it here. But despite Tom's objection, the song would remain blocked, at least up until December 2015, when Prince just randomly decided that it was cool now and it can stay on the internet seven years after it happened. Prince would pass away four months after making that decision. 
At the ending of Daydreaming, you can hear this reversed voice line muttering something completely indistinguishable, unless you're a victim to satanic backmasking. Upon reversing the audio, however, you can clearly hear a pitched down voice muttering the phrase. This is in reference to the at the time recent breakup between Tom and his partner Rachel Owen, which influenced many of the lyrical themes in a moon shaped pool. Paul Thomas Anderson, abbreviated to PTA, is a movie director who had gained major success with his fifth film There Will Be Blood. The film was scored by Johnny Greenwood, who PTA brought on after being impressed by Johnny's body song score in his orchestral piece Popcorn Superhead Receiver. Johnny was initially hesitant in scoring for the film, but after PTA's assurance he decided to stick with it and after three weeks in the studio, came out with two hours of music composed for the film. This would go on to become a landmark moment in Johnny's scoring career. He would also go back to compose for other films directed by PTA. Not only would this spark a tight relationship between PTA and Johnny, however, but between PTA and the band as a whole. He would go on to direct the music videos for Daydreaming and the two CR78 performances, as well as Tom's short film Anima. A majority of the lyricism in Kid A is utterly random delving away from personal themes and emphasizing abstract surrealism. Inspired by how David Byrne constructed the lyrics for Remain in Light, Tom wrote various phrases on slips of paper and pulled them out of a hat, which the band described as pieces in a collage creating an artwork out of a lot of different things. This also explains why the lyrics were omitted from the liner notes, as the band didn't consider them independent of the music and wanted to diverge attention away from them. While brushed upon briefly during the Meeting People is Easy explanation, the OK Computer Tour ended up severely affecting band members to a point where they nearly considered breaking up afterwards. No member was on the same page in which way to carry on their career, whether it be through guitar music by Ed's suggestion or doing something completely different by Tom's. This all resulted in a complete burnout and with that came massive writer's block, which would then culminate into the studio experimentation that paved the way toward Kid A, ushering in a whole new era for the band's career, far different than what they initially anticipated. Tom York has been abundant in praises for pop sensation Billie Eilish, saying once back in 2019 that he likes Billie Eilish. There's even a clip of him dancing along to her music at one of her concerts, after one of her shows, Tom approached Billy saying that she's the only one doing anything very interesting nowadays. Billy's brother and producer Phineas described the moment as the coolest thing that anyone's ever said to Billy. Thank you, Tom. Very cool. Awkward Tom York Interview is a YouTube video that's been floating around for quite some time. It's an excerpt of an interview from the Reflections on Kid A documentary. The interviewer continuously egged Tom on with questions about personal conflict between the band, which Tom repeatedly turned down. Personally, tension aside, I don't see anything too awkward about Tom's response here. He's free to keep private about his personal life and it's understandable why he'd get upset about someone pressing on for answers. Honestly, the real awkward thing going on here is this very camera angle. I don't know whose idea it was to shove the camera mere centimeters from Tom's face, but it gets really uncomfortable to watch this lingering around Tom's lips there for a solid minute and a half. In 2016, Radiohead were approached to compose the main theme for the upcoming James Bond film Spectre. It's speculated that the version of Man of War released on OK Not OK was initially made for the film given that it sounds like a modern recording of the song. However, it was ultimately scrapped by the studio because it wasn't recently written. To compensate for that, Radiohead ended up writing a new song, fittingly titled Spectre. Eventually though, that too would be scrapped in favor of a very Sam Smith song. So the band ended up just saying f and released Spectre on SoundCloud in December of 2015. Nigel Godrick was pretty frustrated by the whole affair, as it interrupted the recording sessions for a moon-shaped pool for something that ended up just falling through in the end. From Reggie Watts' Alive at the Central Park performance in 2012, there was a short bit where he did an impersonation of a Radiohead song. Apparently it's supposed to be a parody, but I don't exactly get how because it's actually a pretty decent cover of Idiotech. Back in February of 2013, to support the release of Amok, Tom York and Nigel Goderick did an Ask Me Anything interview on Reddit. 
for the most part it's your standard AMA affair, with Nigel acting as a straight man in contrast to Tom's drunkard responses. What's really the best thing about this AMA though is the signature Tom gives in his responses, simply being his name shortened down to just Tum. I'm not here, this isn't happening is a mantra REM frontman Michael Stipe told Tom to say to himself over and over again to help deal with the pressure Tom was facing with touring. After the abysmal experience with touring for OK Computer, the line would eventually find its way on their subsequent album Kid A as an integral lyric to the song How To Disappear Completely. Ironically enough, a few years later Stipe called up Tom in cold sweats due to the fact that he thought he accidentally plagiarized How To Disappear Completely for the R.E.M. song Disappear, and this time it was Tom consoling him that the song came from a conversation they had four years ago. Diandas Martinet is an early French electronic instrument originally invented in 1928. You can play it through the keyboard, but its central gimmick is this ring that you slide along a wire, producing a sound that resembles a theremin. In 1999, Johnny picked up an Andes Martinet during the recording sessions for Kid A and Amnesiac, and as a result, the sound of the instrument can be heard frequently throughout those records, as well as throughout the rest of the band's discography and Johnny's solo career. Interestingly enough, Johnny had never seen the instrument before until it was delivered to the band's studio, and he learned how to play it entirely by himself. In an interview with Suzanne Benet Audet, an established Andist, Johnny admitted that his main draw to the Andes Martinet is due to his lack of singing ability, and that the instrument's vibrato is the closest he could find to replicate a human voice. Tom is drawn by many different throughout his career, with most of them pertaining to his artwork. Although Dr. Chalk is the most prominent one, other various examples include the White Chocolate Farm, Zachariah Wildwood, Timx, and my personal favorite, Sussy Baca, which we'll be getting more into later. Chieftain Muse is a character from various Radiohead videos and social media ads who first appeared back in 2004 as the host for the most gigantic lying mouth of all time. Hello. Welcome to the most gigantic lying mouth of all time. Which we'll get into later. He's yet another bald oddity in the Radiohead sphere, notable for his strange behavior, painted nails, and slanted eyes. He was just recently used abundantly for the Radiohead TikToks that appeared throughout 2021. To this day, it's unknown who exactly plays the role of Chieftain Muse. Some have speculated that it's either Stanley Donwood, one of the members of the band, or someone else entirely different. But perhaps we'll never know. Maybe instead of asking who is Chieftain Muse, we should be asking how is Chieftain Muse, because I'm really unsure if this guy is alright. Wait, is that the very Angry Birds song? After the King of Limbs released on February 18th, 2011, a lot of fans were puzzled by the brevity of the album. With it being four years since In Rainbows released, and the album being only eight tracks long, not even reaching a standard 40 minutes in length. Fans started inhaling bountiful amounts of copium and got high off of the deluded promise that a second part was on its way. There were some theories that went wild, but a specific one that I remember was the newspaper branded special edition hinting at there potentially being reoccurring pressings, much like an actual newspaper. At this point people weren't just expecting a King of Limbs Part 2, but a King of Limbs 3, King of Limbs 4, hell maybe even a King of Limbs 5. Of course in hindsight, we know now that none of this ever happened, and it's unknown if the band ever even intended to do a part 2 in the first place. So instead of receiving a new album just around the corner, fans ended up having to wait many, many years later for Radiohead to get back in the studio and create a moon-shaped pool. While we're on topic of the King of Limbs in the studio though, in the liner notes for The King of Limbs, there's a specific shout out to Hollywood actress Drew Barrymore, saying a big thank you very much indeed to Drew Barrymore. Many fans were puzzled by the shout out, as Drew isn't exactly the first example many have to mind when thinking of Radiohead affiliates. Allegedly, the shout out alludes to the fact that a portion of the album may have been recorded at a makeshift studio in Drew's Los Angeles home at least according to this article from The Guardian. If all of this is true, 
that I wonder if it played a factor in why this album was mixed like very dog shit. It's been debated online for many years since Kid A's release whether or not Tom sings Here I'm Aloud or Here I'm Alive in the chorus for the attack. Eventually in 2021, the Kid Amnesia art exhibition at Christie showcased an early lyric sheet for Idiot Tech written by Tom. In this, you can clearly see the phrase Here I'm Alive written between the brackets. Additionally, the Fear Stalks of the Land book that was included in the rollout for Kid Amnesia also contains no mention of the phrase Here I'm Aloud, even in the cut lyrics. Despite that it's been practically confirmed at this point that he says alive, there are many detractors who will still argue that it's allowed, and it's likely this debate will go on until There's this image that circulated around the internet for quite some time which showcases Tom doing a little jig in the background of this photo taken at the Louvre Art Museum. During the 2013 Reddit AMA, user Monocock asked Tom if he was posing for the picture, which Tom replied, that is not me. This is Madame Tussauds, misspelled probably. Upon Creep's release, Grandor Music, who published the Hollies The Air That I Breathe, took radio to court for plagiarism of the song. It culminated in Albert Hammond and Mike Hazelwood, the duo who had written The Air That I Breathe, only taking a little piece of the royalties due to Radiohead's honesty about reusing the composition. And honest they were, I'd even remarked about the similarities back when they were recording it. Decades later in 2018, Lana Del Rey took to Twitter that Radiohead's publisher Warner Chapel Music was taking her to court for 100% of the publishing royalties from her song Get Free. In the end though, they only got a whopping no percent as the lawsuit ended with Del Rey still holding all of the rights for her song. The most gigantic lying mouth of all time is a DVD released in 2004 which contains 24 short films which were initially broadcasted online from Radiohead.tv throughout 2003. The 24 shorts were divided between four episodes created by Chris Brand, Stanley Donwood, and the band, while also including shorts created by fans who were selected for inclusion. Like I mentioned earlier, this was the first appearance of Chieftain Muse, who introduced and closed each episode. There is even a short bit of him doing a parody of the No Surprises music video at the end of the DVD which is super cool. Much of the content varied wildly with each short, with some being music videos for songs like Sit Down, Stand Up, and Polk Pole, while others barely had any resemblance to Radiohead at all, such as When an Angel Tries to Sell You Something. I remember this video being my first exposure to the DVD back when it randomly appeared on my YouTube feed, and I've fallen in love with it ever since. Space Ghost Coast to Coast is an animated talk show which aired on Cartoon Network from 1994 to 1999, while also having a few revivals on Adult Swim in 2001 and 2006. It's also a cool fairy show, and you should watch it, especially the 2001 revival, where an episode from September 2nd, 2001, just nine days before Nothing Significant, features none other than our boy Tom. The interview mostly just revolves around the cast getting into zany scenarios while Tom stares begrudgingly, and it's pretty funny. Hey look, Multar even has his knives out for the interview. <laughs> Something also interesting to note is that not only does it feature Tom for an interview, but Bjork as well. And I'm sure there's a sizable enough overlap here that we'll find that to be pretty entertaining too. So like I said, just watch Space Ghost Coast to Coast. At the time of uploading this, you can view the episode on HBO Max along with the rest of the series. While we're on topic of Tom York on television, then I just have to talk about this instance from the 2007 airing of the Big Fat Quiz of the Year. It starts off with Jimmy Carr introducing Tom York as the supreme god of music, which is undeniably correct. Tom comes on to promote the release of In Rainbows while acting like some deranged malfunctioning robot. Which is pretty funny, but completely overshadowed by when he goes full goofy and. That was good, wasn't it? <laughs> if you ever wanted to view the clip yourself, you can find it on YouTube under the title of Tom York Laughs Funny. At the start of the Benz's title track, the band added tinkling sound effects which Tom had recorded on a cassette through a hotel room window while touring in the United States. According to Tom, there was this guy training these 8-year-old kids, 
were parading up and down with all these different instruments. The guy had a little microphone on his sweater and he was going like, Yeah, keep it up, keep it up. So I ran out and taped it. After returning to the studio from a restaurant, Tom recorded the vocals for Planet Telex laid up in the corner of the studio, completely drunk off his ass. While struggling to get a good vocal take for Fake Plastic Trees, the band took a break from recording to attend a Jeff Buckley concert at Finsbury Park in London. After returning to the studio, Tom, inspired by Buckley, nailed the first vocal take he attempted again for the song. Jeff Buckley ended up being a huge influence on Tom's vocal styles, with Tom later remarking in an interview that Jeff showed him that it's possible to sing in a falsetto without sounding drippy. As we know with Space Ghost, Radiohead are no strangers to adult animation and have appeared on two of the biggest shows in the industry, South Park and Family Guy. Much like Family Guy itself, Tom York's parodied camo isn't particularly funny, the so South Park cameo is much better, it. and even features the entire band playing a crucially important role in the season 5 episode Scott Tennerman Must Die. If you haven't seen the episode before, I'll briefly recap. Though be forewarned, I do have to spoil it to get into the importance of Radiohead's role, so skip ahead a bit if you need to. In the episode, one of the lead children characters, Eric Cartman, purchases P from an older boy named Scott Tennerman to brag to his friends about approaching manhood before them. Upon being informed that he's supposed to grow his however, he winds up getting involved in a cat and mouse scenario with Scott Tennerman to get his money back, though he would repeatedly fail with his attempts. Upon learning that Scott's favorite band is Radiohead, Cartman constructs a fake MTV interview with him overdubbing the audio in his voice to portray the band scolding Scott, however when that failed, he masterminded an elaborate scheme which involved flying the band out to South Park due to Scott having cancer in his ass. Later on in the episode, after Cartman gets Scott's parents killed and cooks them into a chili which he feeds to Scott, the entire band would appropriately scold the traumatized Scott Tennerman for being a crybaby, which couldn't be more ironic coming from literally any other band. In the commentary for the episode, South Park creators Trey Parker and Matt Stone discuss bringing Radiohead in for the voice work remarked how it was funny to direct Tom to emote more, since he claimed he's incredibly emotional while singing. What's really interesting though is while discussing how the band were fans of the episode, he quickly threw in that the idea of Scott Tennerman eating his own parents was the band's idea, which is something I find really very cool because that's the part that just makes the whole episode. The line kicking, squealing, Gucci little piggy refers to an experience Tom faced at a bar in Los Angeles where he was surrounded by strangers high on and witnessed a woman having a total meltdown after someone spilled a drink on her. Tom stated that there was a look in the woman's eyes that I'd never seen before anywhere. Couldn't sleep that night because of it. This experience would also influence a similar scene in the music video, where the lead character Robin accidentally stumbles off and proceeds to get his drink spilled on a guy's pants who appropriately reacts by strangling Robin and pouring the rest of the drink on his face. During their recording for No Surprises, the band wanted to play the song so slowly that it made it harder to play accurately on their instruments. To compensate for this, Nigel Godric had the band play at a faster tempo, took that recording and slowed it down, which Tom then sang vocals over top of. Because the recording wasn't slowed down a full step, the pitch in the studio recording is somewhere between the keys of E and F, meaning it's practically impossible to make it sound like the studio version live unless the band tunes their instruments all funkily. In 2010, pop artist Katy Perry released a single titled The One That Got Away. The song's pretty notorious for the batshit insane lyrics in the first verse, which say, Summer after high school, when we first met, we'd make out in your Mustang to Radiohead. Unsurprisingly, a lot of people were confused by this lyric. Funnily enough, this isn't the only time a Radiohead-related lyric would make its way onto one of these massive teenage girl pop anthems. At first I had this confused with the song Here's to Never Growing Up by Avril Lavigne, which contains this lyric in the chorus. Singing Radiohead at the top of our lungs, with the boombox blaring as we're falling in love. While it isn't as strange as the Katy Perry lyric, it can be something pretty funny to imagine if you think about it the right way.
Honestly, there's no reason for me to even talk about this as it doesn't pertain to anything important involving Radiohead. I just find the Gallaghers really funny when they start running their mouths, and it's certainly no exception when they start trashing on Radiohead. Perhaps the most legendary headline ever stems from an article by Ultimate Guitar that reads, Noel Gallagher, Radiohead are boring, One Direction are c**t, everyone's a except Kanye. The article contains no shortage of infectious vulgarity either. I'm aware that Radiohead have never had a very bad review. I reckon if Tom York theory shit into a light bulb and started blowing it like an empty beer bottle, it'd probably get 9 out of 10. Very. Mojo. I'm aware of that. It's great stuff. Don't expect Noel's brother Liam to spare any remorse on the band either. He took to Twitter one day with a few words to say about them. So I'm in this crazy house, every f***er is banging on about this band radio play, help. Some tune called Creepy Fuffker. <laughs> Planet Tickle. The Bond. I'm out. For f sake. The rapping in the middle of the bends taking the piss. How the f*** did these Teds get big? Karma Police, that's it. Karma Police, for f sake. Come on, you Karma Police. What album is fucking Karma Police on? He closed out the rant peacefully. Right, it's going off. The Office Charts are a series of playlists which band members would occasionally share on their blog Dead Airspace from 2008 through to a year after the release of A Moon-Shaped Pool. If you're ever in the mood to discover a bunch of new music, and specifically curious what the members of Radiohead are into, I highly recommend going through the playlist yourself. They're easily found on Spotify through the shared playlist on their artist page, or through the direct links from the Radiohead Public Library, or you can dig through the Dead Airspace archives to find them through that too. A notable one that I'd like to make mention of is one from Johnny on June 3rd, 2010, where he shared not a list of his favorite songs, but some of his favorite video games. Cave Story, Half-Life 1 and 2, Ico, which he specifically cited as the best on the list. Suffice to say, Johnny's got some good taste. Some other interesting ones are Johnny's chart from June 6, 2009 that includes a hip-hop playlist he made for a friend to get him into the genre, showcasing artists like Public Enemy, A Tribe Called Quest, and Eric B. and Rakim, and this Christmas-inspired one from December 12, 2014, dedicated to Christmas jackhammers and blink houses from Tom, or uh, I mean the Le Grinch. As of nowadays, it would appear that the band has abandoned the idea of doing office charts, the last one being from May 9th, 2015, if you don't count the live from a moon-shaped pool playlist at least. Nowadays, at least Tom occasionally shares playlists called In the Absent Thereof, which he so far has nine entries to, if you're ever curious to know what he's been listening to lately. Before live performances of Everything in Its Right Place, the band will do an atmospheric intro of the song, usually containing a brief cover of another artist. These include covers of After the Gold Rush by Neil Young, Unravel by Bjork, End of the World and the One I Love by R.E.M., Maps by the Yeah Yeah Yeahs, If You Tolerate This Your Children Will Be Next by Manic Street Preachers, and potentially more that I forgot to mention. Additionally, the band have also done brief performances of Follow Me Around and True Love Waits before they were properly released, and occasionally they'll do something improvisational like the Here Comes the Flood segment on the I Might Be Wrong EP. At the end of Karma Police and live shows, Tom will hold the mic out to the crowd encouraging a sing-along to the For a Minute There I Lost Myself outro. For what I could find, the earliest instance of this was at Bonnaroo 2006, where it happened seemingly unplanned. Throughout the 2010s, the band would encourage the scene along more frequently, with it becoming a mainstay during the Moon Shaped Pool tour. When I saw them live in 2018, I had no idea at the time that this was even a thing, and to say the least, I may have been a little shocked when I witnessed it. It's just magical. Paranoid Android is played during the closing credits of the anime Ergo Proxy. The band didn't want it to be in there, but after being shown a clip of the show, they decided to allow it. 
Noah York is the son of Tom York who's been embarking on a music career of his own. Getting his start in 2019 with a few singles released under the alias Alec Owen on SoundCloud, then releasing a lockdown inspired project called Lethal, he would eventually start releasing singles as Noah York in 2021 with his song Trying Too Hard, Lullaby, which Tom would feature on the sixth installment of his In The Absent Thereof playlists. Alongside his solo career, he's also a member of the two-piece Hex Girlfriend, which takes on a much more industrial-inspired style of sound. It's some pretty interesting stuff. Not a lot that I want to say about it here, but I'm curious to see where he'll grow with his career from this point onwards. In the Harry Potter universe, there exists a band called the Weird Sisters. For the soundtrack of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, the music by the Weird Sisters was actually performed by Johnny Greenwood and Phil Selway, who played along with pulp members Jarvis Cocker and Steve Mackey. The three songs recorded for the film include This Is The Night, Magic Works, and the legendary Do The Hippogriff. All the performing members even appeared in the film as well. Here you can see Johnny and guitar and Phil banging it out on the drums. The Blackest White Band refers to an article written by Daphne A. Brooks and published by The Guardian in 2020 titled, Why Radiohead Are the Blackest White Band of Our Times. I know this can be a bit of a sensitive topic to get into, but what I'm getting at is, well, what I'm trying to say is that... Come on now. Just take this excerpt for instance. It might sound absurd if judging by their slightly awkward, extremely white appearance, but I have long heard a strange and beautiful blackness in Radiohead. There are powerful resonances between their work and radical black art that are more meaningful than ever amid our current racial reckoning. Huh. I guess that's why Tom wanted to say it. Hell to the Thief went through many potential titles throughout the recording of the album, including The Gloaming, Little Man Being Erased, The Bony King of Nowhere, and Snakes and Ladders, though most of these would wind up being subjected as subtitles for the individual tracks. Hail to the Thief, the finalized title, originates from a chant which was used by anti-George W. Bush protesters following the 2000s controversial US presidential election as a play on the phrase Hail to the Chief. The band ended up choosing that title as a reference to Bush, as a reference to the album leaking before its release, and also in response to the rise of doublethink in general intolerance and madness, like individuals were totally out of control of the situation, a manifestation of something not really human. I Will is one of those songs written during the Kid Amnesia sessions that wound up being released on Hail of the Thief. During the initial sessions, the band struggled to create an electronic version of I Will. Tom described it as dodgy craftwork, and without knowing what to do with it, they decided to just f with it instead. Through reversing it, they spawned the framework for what would become like spinning plates. Given from this, if you end up reversing spinning plates, it'll have the same chord progression as I Will. YouTube user Falcon Flurry has a pretty interesting video where he combined the two songs together. It doesn't sound perfect, but it gives us a good idea to what this early version of I Will possibly could have sounded like. A sample from Paul Lansky's early electronic piece titled Mild und leise can be heard all throughout Idiot Tech. The sampled part occurs at the 43 second mark of the song, and after hearing Idiot Tech so many times, it's quite surreal hearing the chord progression in its original context. Additionally, a compilation album called Electronic Music Winners, which includes the Paul Lansky song, also features a song called Short Piece by Arthur Krieger that contains the <laughs> sample heard throughout. On May 26, 2019, a Reddit user named Zimbra joined the Waste Discord server inquiring for people knowledgeable about bootlegs. The bootleg in question turned out to be 18 very hours of the OK Computer recording sessions. Zimbra initially intended to sell the discs, but this quickly got out of hand, 
as a false rumor of ransom requested a small loan of $150,000 for the entirety of the mini discs. To cover up for this, Zimbra ended up releasing the entirety of the mini discs he had for free through a mega link. Although word of the ransom spread out much too quickly, and when it eventually got to the band, despite the entirety of the discs being out at this point, they ended up releasing the mini discs themselves through their Bandcamp page. The download for 18 hours worth of studio sessions stayed up for 18 days, costing 18 euros with all proceeds going towards Extinction Rebellion's charity to prevent climate change. Regardless of the morality of whether or not it was right to release this in the first place, it's honestly hard to argue otherwise that the mini-disc leak isn't one of the coolest bootlegs to ever grace the Radiohead fandom. In 2009, Tom did a remix of the MF Doom song Gazillionaire off of his album Born Like This. Come 11 years later, following the announcement of the Mad Villain's unfortunate passing in December of 2020, Tom shared another remix of the same song along with a statement which reads, I am so sad to hear MF Doom's passing. He was a massive inspiration to so many of us. Changed things. For me, the way he put words was often shocking in its genius, using stream of consciousness in a way I'd never heard before. These wouldn't be the only Doom remixes pertaining to Radiohead, however, and this last one here is probably my favorite of the bunch. Tom and Johnny would actually collaborate for a remix of a song from the villain's JJ Doom it's called Dom Friend. Johnny's contribution is immediately apparent from the start of the song as it's actually a sample of his song Proven Lands, which he made for the There Will Be Blood soundtrack. And I'd imagine Tom's contribution would be these scattering electronic drum beats which he does literally all the time. My favorite bit is around a minute and 40 seconds into the track when that plucked string line kicks in. It's a total earworm and I always find it randomly getting stuck in my head. Wall of Ice is related to a rumored EP that Radiohead were working on around 2009, stemming from the mysterious release of the song These Are My Twisted Words. Forgive my brevity, but I'm really just using this as an opportunity to plug a writer's block video on the subject instead, as there's a lot of cool shit that goes on surrounding the song's release and this video already does a great job at thoroughly explaining it. There's no real reason for me to regurgitate that information when it's already viewable on the same website you're watching this on. So go ahead and watch his instead. I'll have a link to it in the description below. Binary Theory alludes to a fan theory about OK Computer and In Rainbows making up a cohesive project when put together. The theory originated from the prevalence of the number 10 leading up to the release of In Rainbows, with it containing 10 tracks and being announced 10 days before it would be released on October 10th, 10 years after the release of OK Computer which is a 10 out of 10 album. You would alternate between tracks from OK Computer and In Rainbows, starting off with Airbag and then going into 15th Step. The entire album would rotate like this save for Karma Police leading into Fitter Happier, although you would go back into Fost Arp afterwards. Obviously, none of this is official, and it's just a bunch of fan doohickey quite similar to the Holy Gift by Tool. A 10 second crossfade can make any two pieces of music work together. So of course combining tracks from two albums made by the same band wouldn't be an exception to the rule. Despite that, it's still pretty interesting at the very least, and a fun way to shake things up a bit after you've heard both of these albums 8 million times like I have. Spotify has an official playlist made for the theory called 0110 if you wanted to take a listen for yourself. The title for Radiohead's debut album Pablo Honey originated from a prank call skit by a New York comedy duo called The Jerky Boys. In the skit they depict an elderly mother asking for their son named Pablo with the desire for them to come to Florida so she could wash their ass. Tom confirmed in an interview that the reason they chose this for the album title was because they were all mama's boys, and they even sampled the skit for the third track off the album called How Do You. In 1987, Tom was involved in a car accident with his girlfriend at the time. Tom was fine, but his girlfriend ended up suffering from severe whiplash. Since then, Tom has had a strong resentment towards cars, with this phobia being a prominent lyrical theme in the songs Airbag, Killer Cars, and Stupid Car. With an album ripe full of themes about separation, a moon-shaped pool fittingly starts off with the word stay and closes things off with leave. It could just be that fans are reading too much into things, but it's far from the only deep cup secret the band would put in a moon-shaped pool. In fact, there's bounds of secrets hidden in just the daydreaming music video alone, which we'll be getting into now. 
There's a plethora of secrets hidden in the daydreaming music video directed by Paul Thomas Anderson. It's a bit much to get into, so I highly recommend this video called The Secrets of Daydreaming, which you can find on Vimeo. For this reason, the number 6 shows up throughout this video in many ways. We've already seen the importance of 23. It is made up of the numbers 2 and 3, and 2 times 3 is 6. But also, the total running time of the song is 6.24, or 6 equals 2 plus 4. The first time you watch it, you get the sense that like an iceberg, much of its weight lies beneath the surface. Never mind, I'll actually just get into it myself. On May 9th, 2016, Reddit user Harvest Luca posted a theory they had about the Daydreaming Music video on the Radiohead subreddit. In their theory, he suspects that in the video, Tom is walking through Radiohead's past. He backs this theory up by showing scenes that depict Tom walking through a hospital, which represents airbag, a pretty house, which represents the No Surprises lyric, the grocery store aisle depicting the fake plastic trees music video, and the final scene where Tom walks in front of the mountains representing the album art for Kid A. Reddit user Yoso Yolo also added that the empty parking lot references a picture of the band sitting inside one taken for Telegraph magazine. What's really interesting though is that Johnny posted this theory onto his Facebook page shortly after Harvest Luca made their post, calling it interesting. Now while this doesn't explicitly confirm the theory to be true, it at least validates it in some way that makes it interesting enough to talk about. I like to think that in some way it is true, but I doubt this means the band sees a moon-shaped pool as their potential final album. In hindsight, we do know nowadays that the band at least has plans to return to the studio together. Ed has remarked in an interview before that a moon-shaped pool did mark an end for that era of the band, so perhaps the reason for them to be looking back is in regards to that. Radiohead were quite the nefarious group of lads during the 2009 Grammys. There was perhaps no victim who suffered their wrath far greater than the hit rap artist Kanye West. When he tried to approach the band backstage, they reportedly snubbed him, and the impact of which was so detrimental that it caused him to sit the f down during their performance of 15 Step. While it's hard to imagine the brutal trauma Kanye must have faced after this incident, I think it's safe to say he got the light end of the stick compared to another unfortunate fellow. Perhaps the greatest antagonist to prop up in the grand scheme of the Radiohead anime would be none other than teenage pop sensation Miley Cyrus, who played a prominent role alongside Kanye West during the 2009 Grammys arc. Her backstory started off simple enough with an episode of her hit Disney Channel show Hannah Montana which featured a scene where two characters, Lily and Oliver, argued over whether or not Radiohead or Coldplay was the better band. Years later, during the 2009 Grammys, much like Kanye West, Miley Cyrus was also enthusiastic to meet the band, but was unfortunately shot down. Miley was infuriated as a result, and ended up having a complete meltdown over it, stating in an interview that she was going to RUIN THEM! Radiohead manager Steve Martin ended up issuing a statement to Us Magazine regarding the scenario, saying that when Miley grows up, she'll learn not to have such a sense of entitlement. Ouch. But in perhaps what's the greatest plot twist in anime history, however, is that there would be none other than very Coldplay to end up hanging out with Miley after the incident. My hat's off to you, Chris Martin. I had my doubts before, but there is nothing in my mind holding me back now from acknowledging that for hanging out with Miley Cyrus after the 2009 Grammys, that Oliver was right all along. Your group is indeed the superior band. Krzysztof Penderecki is a Polish composer notable for his avant-garde utilization of string arrangements to produce extremely dissonant sounds. Penderecki would have a profound influence on Johnny throughout his career with Radiohead and as a solo artist. This influence can be heard prominently during moments like the climbing up the walls crescendo and with the strings throughout how to disappear completely. For more information on Penderecki's influence on Johnny, I highly recommend this video fittingly titled How Johnny Greenwood Was Influenced by Penderecki. Both him and David Bennett Piano do a much more thorough job explaining this subject than I ever could with a short blurb in an iceberg video. And it's some really interesting stuff to look into if you're interested at all with Johnny's contributions to the band. You can find the link in the description below. Ed O'Brien Best Guitar Solos refers to a YouTube video uploaded in December of 2015 by the account Jackson Polyester, 
Despite being titled with best guitar solos, the video depicts Ed either lounging around or adding minor contributions to the performances of the band, playing into the joke that since transitioning to the Kid A sound, Ed has little to add to the overall sound as a rhythm guitarist. In case you're getting the wrong idea here, the video is just a joke, and only cherry picks select moments and songs where there isn't much for Ed to do. Ed's actually an extremely cool factor when it comes to the atmospherics of the band, and the sound he can produce with just his guitar and some pedals is honestly some pretty insane shit. I'll refer you to Joe Edelman's video titled How to Play Like Ed O'Brien if you want to take a deep dive into what his guitar playing is like. I'll have a link to it in the description as well. Shortly after the band finished OK Computer, they were commissioned to do the soundtrack for David Fincher's 1999 film Fight Club. When talking about it with BBC Radio 6, Tom said things sort of come into my office, but they haven't really got to me. The one I remember is one from years ago after we'd finished OK Computer, and I was completely gaga. They asked me to do Fight Club. They sent me the script and Edward Norton and Brad Pitt wrote to me and said we really think you should do this. I went nah, I can't, I couldn't. I wouldn't have been able to do it then, but every time I see the film I go, oh. In October 2011, Tom performed a DJ set at the Boiler Room, which is a club located in London that broadcasts various electronic performances online. Tom's set, to say the least, is shrouded in a little bit of infamy. After opening his set with a remix of Bloom from the King of Limbs remix album, Tom would go on to play a variety of songs from artists like 2562, Mode Selector, Aphex Twin, and generally artists involved in more minimalist, IDM-esque genres. Now I should come clean and admit that I'm not the most knowledgeable person when it comes to electronic music, and certainly less so when it comes to the world of DJing, so I can't give you a proper opinion on this set myself. Instead I'll leave it to the audience of the set to decide for me how it went. And, well, it looks like it went terribly. I don't know why, but this imagery of Tom passionately dancing to his bleeps and bloops while a crowd of young adults awkwardly bob around confused on how to dance to it is just super funny to me. It seems like Tom got a kick out of it too, when after six minutes into his set he just whips out his phone to take a picture of the crowd and starts laughing. Eventually Tom would go on to redeem himself a bit when he decided to close the set to America's Most Blunted by Mad Villain. It's so jarring to click between any timestamp on this video and this last song and see the dramatic increase in crowd movement here. If anything, I'm glad this video exists solely to provide comfort after I'm given the aux cord at parties. During the COVID lockdowns, Ed O'Brien started a series of live streams on his Instagram page called In Isolation with Ed. The streams usually involved him interacting with fans or giving interviews to various acquaintances of his. A notable one being his talk with Phil where they reflected on various moments of Radiohead's history. However, what naturally comes with the invitation from artists to interact with fans is the influx of memers eager to get a cheap laugh out of the scenario. I believe that commentary isn't really necessary from this point onward, so I'll just let the clips speak for themselves. Some of the... there's Tom York's wife again. Radiohead gangbang. Hmm, don't think that's ever happened. Ed, do you like my username? Tom York's... No, for God's sake. How old are you? How old are you really? You must be a bloke if you use that kind of terminology. Phil tells us, let me go. Johnny's fat thumb refers to an apology posted on Twitter on April 27th, 2022. The apology was made in response to some brief controversy he got caught in after people noticed him liking derogatory tweets toward individuals who really like Fallout New Vegas. After some outcry on places like Reddit and Reset Era, Johnny would eventually respond to a tweet made by Kid Cat, brilliantly diffusing the scenario by stating the following. Oopsies! Do you guys want to listen to some classical music? Towering Above the Rest is an old bootleg compilation that started circulating on the internet around 2004. It's notable for being really freaking long, containing either a 10 disc or a full on 24 disc variant, with the bulk of these discs mainly containing filler tracks of live performances and remixes. 
Outside of the filler, though, you've got all the B-sides for Up to Hail to the Thief, the On a Friday demos, live performances of, at the time, unreleased songs like Lift and Big Boots, early versions of various songs, live covers, and a variety of other deep cut stuff like Ed Scary's song in Radiohead's part for Split Sides, which I'll be covering later. Not to discredit the compilation, but I wouldn't exactly consider it essential nowadays, since a bulk of the notable things from here can either be found on streaming services or YouTube, where you don't gotta wait through a million live performances just to track down the good stuff. Not to mention the audio quality isn't all too great either, with it mostly being in shoddy sounding 128 kilobits per second mp3s. Despite that though, for its time I couldn't imagine this being anything short of revolutionary for diehard fans who wanted to track down all the deep cut rarities in one convenient download. And for that I gotta say it's pretty awesome. I honestly have fun skimming through the whole thing myself on occasion, not to mention that the cover art is just so cool. I'd also like to shout out the Every Last Crumb bootleg as well. It carries some of the same flaws as towering above the rest and some of its own like lacking the Honor Friday demos and the uber deep cuts and covers, but it's more recent so it goes through to the moon-shaped pool era of the band, with some stuff that towering above the rest lacks as a result. Honestly, if you're a diehard fan with the hard drive space to spare, you'll be well off tracking down both. In 2014, Colin Greenwood participated in the Blenheim Palace Triathlon to help raise money that would benefit for research on leukemia and lymphoma. He was particularly inspired to do this in support of his friend Dan's 9-year-old daughter Scarlett, who was battling with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Colin was a member of the 22-man team Scarlett's Dragons, and along with them took part in events involving running, cycling, and swimming. There's a video on YouTube showcasing some footage of the event from the channel Kurt Idiotech Moron, which also gives us some interviews with Colin detailing his experiences. If you asked me about what sorts of things I was anticipating throughout this year, I could confidently assure you that Johnny Greenwood selling olive oil was absolutely not one of them. Nonetheless, that didn't prevent this sort of thing from happening. In April of 2023, Johnny borrowed a few beats from Sting and embarked on a new venture into the world of... selling olive oil. Apparently, for the past eight years, he's been living at a farm in Italy harvesting olives in his spare time, specifically stating that it's an addicting thing to do, harvesting and pressing this glorious fruit. Come 2023 and the farm finally netted enough harvest to sell some bottles of olive oil commercially, which he did through the Waste Headquarters website. For 35 euros for a 500 milliliter bottle or 60 euros for a 1 liter bottle, you could cop yourself some signature Greenwood oil, with labeling done by Stanley extremely reminiscent of the artwork for The Smile, alongside a signature from Johnny. Unfortunately, these bottles were only shipped out to UK addresses, meaning as American I was exempt from getting any for myself, otherwise I would have had like 50 of these just because they're so cool. Radiohead is a band that doesn't shy away from doing quirky special editions for their many studio albums. There's obviously the stuff they did for In Rainbows, The King of Limbs, A Moon-Shaped Pool, and the OK Computer and Kid Amnesia re-releases. On top of that though, there's also some other cool things. Some of my favorites including the special edition of Amnesiac that's packaged much like the book seen on the album cover, with the disc included in a little pouch that resembles a library card. Additionally, there's this legendary cassette variant of Pablo Honey, which showcases the googly-eyed baby from the Anyone Can Play Guitar single against a striking bright blue background. Alongside the Amnesiac book, it's something I'm extremely proud to have in my personal collection. But for the sake of brevity, I'm gonna try to limit myself here because it's seriously something I could spend all day going over. However, there are just a few more really cool things I would like to go over with you guys real quick. The first is this copy of Kid A given to large chain retail buyers that predominantly contains the album hard coded on a Sony VAIO MP3 player with a little modified bear sticker on the front alongside some other goodies. Allegedly there were only 10 of these ever made and they made specific notice that the album was not for broadcast before September 19th. Similarly, there was also a copy of OK Computer on cassette given away to music reviewers before its release 
The cassette was super glued shut into a portable cassette player, giving you no way to pry it open even if you tried. Unlike the Kid A MP3 player, these are far more abundant, with a thousand of these cassette players being sent out. In relation to OK Computer, the last of these unique variants I'll be going over is this rare limited box set simply called Desktop. The package contains two CDs each of the three singles released for OK Computer, complete with different B-sides for each disc. Alongside that came an OK Computer t-shirt, a mouse pad, an FM radio receiver, and a numbered certificate of its 500 copies. If you're at all interested in picking these up for yourself, then I sincerely wish you the best of luck, as listings of desktop on Discogs are set to put you down over 400 bucks. There aren't even any listings of the OK Computer cassette, and unless you're obscenely rich, even considering buying the Kid A MP3 player can only be seen as a desperate cry for help. On an unrelated note though, I have recently set up a Kofi account, which you can conveniently find in the description or through my channel page. If you're a fan of my content and want to swing me a few bucks, then it's much appreciated, and assured that it's going to a good cause. Scott Pilgrim vs. The World is a 2010 comedy film created by Edgar Wright based on the comic series created by Brian Lee O'Malley. The soundtrack is notable for being executively produced and scored by Radiohead's longtime producer Nigel Goderick, and also being the first film score he's ever worked on. The soundtrack also contains collaborations from Beck, Metric, Broken Social Scene, Cornelius, Dan the Automator, Kid Koala, and David Campbell. Something really cool about this movie is that throughout the record store scene, you can see this chandelier looking prop that features artwork from the eraser. Not only that, but the OK Computer CD on one of the CD racks and an In Rainbows poster in the back of the store. Edgar Wright is a pretty deliberate filmmaker, so it's neat that he could have included these in reference to Nigel's work on the soundtrack. Tom is sort of notorious when it comes to his short temper. He's remarked before in interviews that he considers himself quite an aggressive person, and has even gotten in a few fights before. It ended up culminating in an experience in college where, in his words, he got the living shit beat out of him that may have knocked him off of fighting, but the temper was still there. It would prop up sporadically throughout the band's career. On September 3rd, 2019, YouTube user Ali C published a video titled Tom, you are going mad for four minutes! Surprisingly, a lot of the comments called Tom out for exhibiting toxic behavior and while it's hard to deny that isn't the case, I don't personally think Tom's reactions are entirely unjustifiable. For all things considered, touring and performing seems like a pretty obnoxious job in its own right. I mean, hell, we already talked about that entire documentary the band released showcasing just how pressuring it is for them to do it. Even from the standpoint of someone in the audience, I'd be pretty upset if I paid a decent premium to see a band like Radiohead and end up having I mean, how would you feel if you spent $100 to see Radiohead and then some dickhead decides to talk over it? It's not surprising when the audience is happy for the performers to call that guy out. As for dealing with technical issues, what can I say? It's just one of those things that can be frustrating to deal with. All I can really add here is that if you think Tom is bad when it comes to live shows, I fear for the day if you end up going to a Queens of the Stone Age concert. Hey, do me one favor, though. Don't throw any shit at me. Hey, you! You, you f mother f I will f you up. Come on up here. Come on up here, you f little f It's floated on the internet for quite a while that in early versions of Paranoid Android, Tom's saying God loves his children, that's why he kills them, instead of repeating the first half of the line. However, there's nothing to our knowledge that backs this up. Through the plethora of early versions of Paranoid Android that we have from live performances to the mini discs, not one of them says that's why he kills them. It's kinda hard to imagine the band being that obtuse in their lyricism as well. Suffice to say, it's just some bullshit rumor that has nothing to back it up, and it's puzzling how it even got spread around this much in the first place. Unless someday, somehow, we get a version of Paranoid Android where Tom actually sings that phrase, then it's safe to disregard it as nonsense. In live shows during their OK Computer tour, you can see Johnny wearing this wrist brace thing. He had to wear it due to a wrist injury he had from playing his guitar too much. 
After beating on that thing for years, I'm ecstatic to see that it eventually got its revenge. Believe it or not, however, did you know that this isn't even the coolest thing that Johnny's worn on his wrist? In the mid-90s, Johnny used to perform with this thing that would suction into his fingers. Kinda reminds me of some sort of deranged power glove. It was mainly used for performances of anyone can play guitar- No, not that one! Where during the intro you can hear Johnny's guitar doing all sorts of insane wobbly sounds. It sounds pretty very cool, and I wish he would have performed with it more often. Anyone can play guitar. Complete with robot arm. Get your poxy cameras on that. According to the King of Gear, Johnny actually used two variations of the device. One that resembled its initial patent and another revision that contained lights and an extra knob. Also, apparently a magazine confused the device for a sex toy? That's just very hilarious. During his soundcheck performance of Idiot Tech, which we might as well consider the very Foley Johnny theme song at this point. Tom busts in with the brilliant observation he just made by singing the phrase, I can see the crack in your ass, Johnny, over and over again. That's too a little bit awesome. I can see the crack in your ass, Johnny. Unfortunately enough for Johnny, Tom was firing at all cylinders that night, as right beforehand he was even getting up in arms about the speed of the song too. Poor Johnny, will the guy ever catch a break? In 2012, a remix of the song Hold On by British electronic artist Subtuk oh, it's Subtract, was done by an artist under the alias of CC Bakbak. At the time, Nobody knew who this artist was, and it generated a lot of mystique as unknown producers don't usually wind up doing remixes for major artists all the time. A lot of speculation was drawn to it potentially being done by Tom York from a tweet by DJ Rob DeBank stating, Listening to the Tom York mix of Subtract for the 18th time. Unbeatable. Also adding to the speculation was the fact that Subtract did a remix for Lotus Flower the previous year for the band's King of Limbs remix album. Eventually. It was confirmed on Waste that Tom was indeed CC Bakbak. Kid 17 is a fan theory that hypothesizes playing two copies of the Kid A album 17 seconds apart unlocks a secret album that apparently blends quite well together. If you ask me personally, I think it's a bigger pile of shit than the binary theory, but I'll play this clip for you to decide for yourself. Not convinced? Radiohead, much like literally every band in the world, have been profoundly influenced by an obscure indie outfit called The Beatles. Nigel Godrick produced Paul McCartney's 2006 album Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, which was one of McCartney's more revered solo efforts in recent times. More recently than that, Ed O'Brien even had a remix featured in Paul's Three Imagined album in April of 2021 for his track Slidin'. What's the greatest thing to come from that, however, isn't even the remix song itself. It's this interview Ed had with Paul on his Instagram page the same day as the album's release. When out of nowhere, Paul freezes time and starts talking through his throat. Um, I'm coming back for the bluebells. Yeah, you know, I can't, I can't be out of I don't care if you're a very beetle, Paul. That type of behavior is simply inexcusable. Perhaps as a result of Paul's sickening displays of power, a collaboration was turned down by none other than Tom York to play piano for Paul's song Mr. Bellamy from his 2007 album Memory Almost Full. According to Tom, Tom didn't want to be associated with a song that contained the last name of his longtime enemy, Muse frontman Matt Bellamy. Unravel is a song by Icelandic singer Björk from her 1997 album Homogenic, 
which Tom mentioned as being one of his favorite songs ever in an interview with Spin Magazine from 2006. As for whether that's still the case nowadays is up in the air, as he didn't mention the track in his recent Desert Island Discs interview with BBC Radio 4 back in 2021, which is easily the worst thing to happen this decade so far. Interestingly enough, in the 2006 interview with Spin, he mentioned that he strongly desired to cover the song with the band sometime in the future, which is precisely what they did during their Thumbs Down webcast a year later. On top of the Unravel cover, they also did the Headmaster Ritual by the Smiths as well as Ceremony by New Order. Unlike Unravel, however, the latter two songs aren't officially available on the band's YouTube page. They're still easy to find though if you dig a bit, and you can even view the entire webcast on the Radiohead Public Library if you're inclined to do so. Early versions of Paranoid Android were quite the unit, as some takes of the song can be heard extended up to 11 minutes. These versions don't differ quite as dramatically as you'd assume, however. Most of the girth of these early takes stems from an alternate ending which features an extended organ solo played by Johnny as opposed to transitioning back to the hard rock section like in the studio version. If you want to hear the full 11 minute take, you can find it on the mini disc's fifth disc at around 5.5 minutes in. Though honestly, it's hard to consider this an 11 minute demo as after around the 8 minute mark it's just a jam session that's mostly unrelated to the song. Ever since that one little peer-to-peer -peer service called Napster came onto the scene and set the music industry ablaze to eternal hellfire, Radiohead were not just catching a break when it came to their albums reaching ears before the label gods could dictate so. Kid A ended up appearing online three weeks prior to release, and the Eraser a month early, which Tom expressed regret for not doing so himself. Perhaps the worst case of this came with Hail to the Thief, ironically enough is not only did the album leak online a whole 10 weeks before release, but it was also a version that was unfinished. Suffice to say, the band was pretty pissed off about that, and it played a big part in the band choosing to release the music on their own terms come in rainbows. Just to clarify, it wasn't because the music came early, but rather that it was a version they weren't satisfied with. Colin Breenwood described the leak as being photographed with one sock on when you get out of bed in the morning, which is a punishment I couldn't wish to bear even upon my worst enemy. If you're curious about this early version of Hail to the Thief, you can find it online if you know where to look. It's honestly pretty interesting, as some songs like The Gloaming contain extra verses that don't appear on the proper release. The very first track on the first of the OK Computer mini-discs contains a song called Poison. Not only is it a rough take on exit music that contains entirely different lyrics, but halfway through the track it changes to a similarly rough rendition of Life in a Glass House. It's easy to come to the conclusion that these songs were split apart intended as their own individual tracks, and explains how life in a glass house had an appearance in meeting people is easy. The worm buffet symbols refer to this little box guy who is used frequently in various Radiohead promotional material. He was first introduced in the most gigantic lying mouth of all time during a short blip where he flies onto the screen with the words Worm Buffet underneath him. Though it wouldn't be up until leading into In Rainbow's release where this little guy would become something quite significant. On September 20th, 2007, Radiohead posted this picture filled with a bunch of Worm Buffet guys dancing. I know for certain my dumbass wouldn't have thought twice upon seeing this picture, so thankfully the fans around this time were much brighter. They picked up that the Worm Buffet symbols actually represent a code that when deciphered reads, yes, we are still alive. With this, fans were able to construct a key to decrypt the rest of the Worm Buffet symbols for following messages the band would post on their website. Outside of the release cycle teasing, the Worm Buffet would also appear in various merchandise from the band, on top of appearing throughout the Scotch Mist film and on their website. A decade before works like the Kid Amnesia exhibition, Radio had dabbled their feet into the gamer world with a mobile app series called Polyfauna. The apps were developed by the studio Universal Everything, and contained two entries in total. Polyfauna, the first game, was released in with a theme tied to the King of Limbs. Polyfauna 2, released in 2014, is themed around Tom's solo album Tomorrow's Modern Boxes. Something really cool about these apps is that like the Kid Amnesia exhibition, each of the Polyfauna games contains stems for the music themed around their respective albums. They're honestly really cool little experiences to interact with. I'd love to do a video later down the line that takes a deeper dive into them, 
Perhaps I'll lump them in with the Kid Amnesia exhibition when I eventually get around to doing that. As for now, download the apps and try them out for yourself. They're both free and still regularly updated, so if you feel like killing time, I strongly recommend both of them. Dogwander is an unreleased track from the OK Computer era. There's a bit of mystique to the track, as it didn't appear at all on the mini-discs, and it was never played live to an audience. The only proof we really have of its existence is this page that appeared on the band's website during the time that reads, Dogwander. Bring down another take. Better than another cake. It's been speculated by fans that the song was played briefly during the soundtrack for their MTV 10 spot show on December 19th, 1997. The song which was played doesn't resemble any tracks that we've heard from the band before, and contains lyrics about licking up wounds, similar to a dog, as well as a cake being mentioned. A YouTube commenter named Hilton E claimed that he met with the band after his show and asked about the song appearing on the OK Not OK cassette tape, to which Nigel replied that it was in the running but wasn't good enough. Obviously, since this is a YouTube comment, you should take it with a grain of salt by default, but I feel like the story at least appears realistic enough to be worth mentioning. From the note file in the loophole set, in 2003, Radiohead released dozens of short audio clips on their website and invited fans to create their own tracks and remixes from them. Some of the clips are recognizable from released Radiohead material, mostly held with the Thief tracks, but also some Kid A stuff. The clips aren't very listenable, but there are some interesting moments, including what sounds like Johnny experimenting with a vocoder. Essentially what this boils down to is you have a collection of samples for your sick very Radiohead themed mixtape. Headless Chickens is a band Tom was in during college before the reunition of Anna Friday. If you want to peer into an insane alternate reality, there's multiple videos up on YouTube of the band performing. They were a pretty diverse group too, ranging from your standard punk rock to some groovy ass funk. The song Change Your Mind reminds me a lot of something Prince would make. Something really cool about Headless Chickens is that their shows marked the debut performance of Radiohead's High and Dry, five years before it would show up on the bends. It sounds entirely different too, being driven by a distorted guitar opposed to an acoustic on the studio version. Andy York is the brother of Tom York who's boasted his own adventure into a music career. He was in a band called Unbelievable Truth. Afterwards, he released a solo album in 2008 called Simple. Something else interesting to note about Andy is that back when he was in school at Abington, he was briefly in a band called Illiterate Hands, with one of the three members being none other than Johnny himself. The other member, Nigel Powell, later on performed a drum live stream where he played through a song called One Little Question. Unfortunately, this 16 second snippet is currently the only bit of material from the band that we have. Tom's satiation for speed is an inherent trait that might possibly never be quenched. His very first words to Phil on the first On A Friday rehearsal was the polite request of, Can't you play any f very faster? In the Song Facts page for Fake Plastic Trees, there exists a segment from a Vox interview where Tom is asked about a scene from the movie Clueless. In the scene, a character is listening to Fake Plastic Trees up until his stepsister, Cher, overhears it and refers to the song as crybaby music. When asked if Tom minded the insult, he replied, I mean, I suppose it does piss me off, but I am a moaning crybaby from hell, really. Besides, the characters in that film aren't the kind of people I'd want to like Radiohead. They're just average, two-dimensional Beverly Hills kids, and the person who is actually listening to us in the film is the only three-dimensional character. So the answer is, f*** you. We're for 3D people. I don't think I need to explain why this is hilarious. If you don't like Radiohead and you're still watching this video for some ungodly reason, I just want you to know that it's okay to be inferior. Something funny to note is that years later, Clueless's music supervisor admitted that Cher was reflecting her own opinion of Radiohead at the time. I looked at them as the whiny band, and I was very whatever on them. I became a Radiohead fan later on, but I remember hearing at the time that they were assholes. I had to go to England to show them Clueless, and Tom York was such a great guy. I may have really played up how shallow Cher was. Like, 
Of course she's going to call you whiny. It's a compliment, get it? They were fine with it. On June 11, 2017, Reddit user Graham of Soma posted on the Radiohead subreddit about a discovery they made on the origins of the lyrics for Polk Pole from a children's encyclopedia. In the book titled How Things Work, there exists a segment where it explains the functioning of various doors. The parallels to Polk Pole include the lines there are barn doors, doors in the rudders of big ships, sliding doors, and doors that lock and doors that don't. A few pages later in the book, it also includes the line, doors that let you in and out, but never open. Continuing this topic of unsuspecting lyrical origins, user shoe rates on the Radiohead subreddit discovered that a sizable amount of the lyrics for Knives Out were taken from a British crime drama called Silent Witness. Series 2, episode 6 of the series contains a scene with the character saying the phrases, if I was a dog, I would have been drowned at birth. Look into my eyes, it's the only way you'll know I'm telling the truth. And he's not coming back. As well as a likely inspiration for the line, he's bloated and frozen. Citizen Insane Videos on YouTube has a great video showcasing the scenes where each respective quote is pulled from. From May 21st to June 6th of 2015, Stanley Donwood held an art exhibition called The Panic Office, where throughout its 18-day run it would showcase various album covers and other artworks Stanley had created for Radiohead. To soundtrack the exhibition, Tom brought it upon himself to record a short piece of music that would span throughout the entire duration of the event. The song, titled Subterranea, is 432 hours of atmospheric experimental sounds and field recordings, or in more practical terms, a lot of fun with a pulse stretcher. Apparently this was regarded as one of the longest pieces of music ever recorded, at least according to people who have never heard of Bull of Heaven. Unfortunately, the piece of music was never officially released. However, there is a snippet of it you can hear on YouTube through the channel Citizen Insane Videos, which also outlines some more details of the song in the description. Like how apparently this is a sequel to another song Tom recorded four years prior for a different Donwood installation. Personally, I just don't have the weeks to spare to look into that right now. But if you're up to the task, then hey, the knowledge is out there. How to be like Colin Greenwood or colin-greenwood.blogspot.com is a webpage that showcases a myriad of quotes and anecdotes pulled from dozens of interviews over the years illustrating Colin's interests, hobbies, favorite books and music and more, alongside guiding you through 10 easy steps to be more like Colin Greenwood. The steps are as follows. 1. Be personable. 2. Freaking buy Sparkle Horse Records. 3. Enjoy a drink now and then. 4. Read a book. Several, in fact. 5. Travel often. Eat well. 6. Be a devoted family man. 7. Dabble in photography. 8. Get a very nice suit. 9. Maintain academic connections after graduation and 10. Learn to play an instrument. Normally I wouldn't ever be one to do face reveals, but I feel it's absolutely necessary to testify the fact that the results are indeed nothing short of immaculate, especially evidenced by the multitude of accolades the site has received. It's of my utmost recommendation for you to browse through it at your own volition. In February 2001, MTV Latin America hosted a contest for fans to create a music video for the national anthem from Kid A. Unfortunately, no matter how hard I searched, I couldn't find a lot of information about this contest, other than the fact that it existed. I don't know what the prize was, or who all the runner-ups were, but thankfully I was able to fish out five entries, including the selected winner. Of the videos I found, one depicts a fast-paced psychedelic tour of a city, another of the song overlaid on top of edited footage of a church band, which is pretty bizarre. Another is a paper animation of the band performing the song with a bunch of modified bear characters watching in the audience, at least up until a psychotic one scares them all away and two of them have to deal with it accordingly. 
then another is a flash animation depicting a plane crashing into what sort of resembles the mountainscape on the Kid A artwork, where all of the passengers morph into a giant monster that chases a little kid to a cliffside. The final video here is the winning entry done by Juan E. F who would eventually go on to do work on comics for DC and Marvel. Inspired by the concept of Kid A resembling the first cloned human, the animation depicts clones being made of Tom that mutate into feral, modified bears. One which Tom would eventually end up duking it out with before he wakes up revealing it all to be a bad dream. Unless it wasn't. To say the least, I find all of these videos to be incredibly charming, and I highly encourage you to watch through them on your own. There's a pastebin link in the description that goes through each of the videos I discussed here. Also, I don't doubt that the reason for information on this being so hard to find for me is because I live in the US. So if there's anyone from Latin America watching this that could provide more insight to the contest, please let me know in the comments. So apparently the prize was that he got to see the band in Houston and meet them afterwards. And uh, he worked on it for a sh ton of time eating purely hot dogs for three weeks, which is uh, pretty cool is an Icelandic post-rock group that's been plenty involved with Radiohead throughout their early aughts. They were occasionally an opening act for Radiohead during the Kid A and Amnesiac tours, which would play a huge role in giving the band exposure outside of Iceland. Additionally, in 2003 the two would collaborate together on a soundtrack for their Mercy Cunningham Dance Company called Split Sides. Both and Radiohead performed around 20 minutes worth of music live described as being a random assortment of sounds fed through electronic equipment. In fact, Johnny has stated in an interview with Billboard that the dancers wouldn't have heard the music until they started. He would go on to release their half of the collaboration as an EP titled. But Radiohead has never released their composition officially. There was a low-quality bootleg that circulated from the towering above the rest compilation, but a proper rip wouldn't be heard until 2009 when the Mercy Cunningham Dance Company released the Split Sides piece officially on DVD. Radiohead's composition, titled, Untitled, not to be confused with that one, is exactly what you'd expect a 20 minute long amalgamation of various Radiohead noises to sound like. There's theremin-like synthesizers, skittery drum machine loops, atmospheric drones, chopped and distorted vocal samples of Tom, and speaking of Tom, it would appear that he got the helm at around 3 minutes and 50 seconds in, when you can hear the gloaming just start playing out of nowhere. If you want to hear the piece for yourself, it was uploaded onto YouTube by Hunter O'Brien, which I'll have a link to in the description. I'll also include a link to an article by Park Place Projects, the stage manager of the performance, which gives a lot of behind the scenes insight to the dance piece. Before a gig at Denver in 1995, the band had their equipment stolen from their rental truck outside of an inn, within that being Johnny's Ebony Frost Telecaster Plus. Nearly two decades later, a person who was browsing the King of Gear noticed that Johnny's stolen guitar was one they actually owned through purchasing it in Denver back in the 90s. The King of Gear redirected them to Plank, the band's guitar tech, and through that reunited Johnny with his stolen guitar after 19 years. Band-Aid is a charity supergroup comprised of various British and Irish musicians that have performed the song Do They Know It's Christmas a total of four times since its formation back in 1984. The third performance, Band-Aid 20, is notable for featuring three members of Radiohead, Tom on piano, Johnny on guitar, and Nigel as a producer. I don't know why, but it's quite surreal seeing all these guys playing your Christmas song of all things. But believe it or not, it's not even the weirdest thing about this performance. One of the many featured vocalists of the song would be none other than Chris Martin, meaning that this is an official Radiohead and Coldplay collaboration, which is just bizarre. And to pile on top of all of this, this isn't even the first time that Radiohead have done a Christmas song. During the Inside Out webcast in 2001, Radiohead busted into a more unusual sound for them with the cover of Winter Wonderland. They don't get too weird with it as it resembles the original pretty strongly, which honestly just goes to make it even weirder. Yeah, it's, the it's, it's the Smurfs. It's the Smurfs, isn't it? Um. <clears throat> Sleep is rain. Are you listening? In the rain, the snow is glistening. A beautiful sight. We're happy tonight. 
For a brief period of time before Johnny would join on a Friday, there existed a member in the lineup named Raz Peterson, who was credited in their first demo tape for playing alto and tenor saxophone. In fact, he wasn't the sole saxophonist in the group, as in early pictures we can see that there was a trio that featured an additional two female members, though it can be speculated that they only participated in live performances and weren't around for recording sessions. Aside from his contributions in On a Friday, there's nothing else we know about Raz, other than that he'll unfortunately have to go down as the peep best of Radiohead. During their performance of The Gloaming at Buenos Aires, Argentina, the railing separating the stage from the crowd suddenly collapsed. Upon taking notice to this, Tom halted the show while the railing would get repaired. This was no easy fix as it took over 15 minutes until the show would resume. Upon halting the show, Tom started singing an a cappella rendition of the gloaming himself to try and console the audience, like a lullaby of sorts. It's a really sweet moment. It reminds me of a similar occurrence that happened during a performance of Myxomatosis in Toronto, Canada. One of the audience members started having a seizure, and when Tom noticed, he halted the show until the person got help. After assuring that he was safely taken away, the band immediately resumed to the exact moment where they initially left off. It was brief and professional, and as a result of that, really very cool. Not everything is all sunshine and rainbows in Argentina, however. During a performance of Weird Fishes in 2009, Tom ended up getting the George Bush treatment after he sang the line, Follow to the Edge of the Earth. During a performance of Faw Start from a concert at Auburn, Washington in 2008, Tom and Johnny just kept fearing up the song. <laughs> After the first failure, they broke into an impromptu cover of Tell Me Why by Neil Young. Tom forgets the lyrics and starts moaning them. Phil runs up and leaves a dollar on the floor as if they're street performers and gives a little clap for them, then runs away. <laughs> After Johnny held the dollar up to Tom, they broke back into Faust Arp again without making any mistakes this time. Despite going on to become one of the biggest rock bands in the world, not one member ended up studying music in college. In fact, up to this day, Tom doesn't... Technically, the only member that actually did learn some music would be Johnny, unsurprisingly. But considering that he dropped out of college just after two weeks to reform with On A Friday, I think it's safe to say that that doesn't count. Early versions of Reckoner can date back to live performances of the song all the way back to 2001, six years before it would wind up on In Rainbows. Calling it an early version is a bit of a stretch, however, as the Reckoner of these times is practically an entirely different song and bears little resemblance to the studio version aside from the chorus containing the words Reckoner and having a drum groove at certain parts. In fact, the song is practically the polar opposite of the studio version, as you've heard. 
It's way heavier, and almost reminds me of the song Tension Head by Queens of the Stone Age. This early take on Reckoner wouldn't see a proper release until two years after in Rainbows, in the form of a solo single by Tom called Feeling Pulled Apart by Horses. Don't go into this expecting a one-to-one -one similarity to the early take, however. As much like the rest of Tom's solo material, it's an electronic take on the song with a much bigger emphasis on ambience. Max MSP is a piece of music software that's controlled using coding in the form of drag and drop blocks. Johnny's used the software a plethora of times throughout Radiohead's career, especially during the King of Limbs era. Perhaps my favorite usage of it though would be from live performances of Go To Sleep. There was a pretty funny scenario that happened between Radiohead and Max MSP developers cycling 74 before. Back in December of 2007, shortly after In Rainbow's release, the band lost the password for their software. When Johnny tried contacting the developers for a new password, Cycling74 responded by saying, Why don't you pay us what you think it's worth? As a funny little jab towards the pay what you want model. Johnny Greenwood launched a drone strike on their headquarters shortly after. I covered this zany scenario in this video you can watch here. No Logo is a book written by Canadian author Naomi Klein that was published in 1999. In the book, Naomi criticizes brand-oriented consumer culture and the operations of large corporations, as well as accusing the corporations of unethically exploiting workers in the world's poorest countries in pursuit of greater profits. The book was a massive influence for Radiohead, especially during the Kid Amnesiac era, to a point where they even considered the title for Kid A as No Logo for a period. On Naomi's website, there's a section written by The Guardian which states, The band Radiohead were so inspired by No Logo that they have banned corporate advertising from their British tour, deeming all venues logo free. This being what inspired the tent venues they did during that era. Nowadays, however, it seems as though the band isn't as behind the No Logo influence as they once were. And I know that firsthand because I saw them live at Very Little Caesars. During a show in Paris shortly after the release of A Moon-Shaped Pool, a woman fainted halfway through a performance of Nude. The show immediately resumed upon the moment the woman was safely escorted, but things must have got pretty heavy upon ending the song as Tom can be seen tearing up afterwards. to say what exactly caused this, and I doubt Tom is the type of person to want to let us know regardless. I imagine it could just be a bunch of different things compounding together at once. What with witnessing the woman fainting, or dealing with the fact that his ex-wife Rachel was still suffering with cancer at the time, and with Nude already being an extremely emotional song on top of both of those things. Or maybe it's the fact that he had to stop the performance at literally the best part of the song, who knows. Whatever it is that caused it still a pretty upsetting thing to witness. I just hope that things were fine for him afterwards. Originally intended to be a demo, Tom recorded How I Made My Millions at his home on a 4-track tape recorder. When presented to the band, they admired the song and wanted to keep it as is, meaning you hear that rough, untouched home recording in the officially released version of the song with all of the background noises intact that you would normally edit out on a proper studio recording. Amongst these background noises is the sound of Rachel Owens, Tom's ex-partner, doing various things in the background. It's almost a haunting little detail in retrospect, especially coupled with the sorrowful tone of the song and the nostalgic, fluttering textures the cassette recording provides. On June 16, 2012, 
Radiohead were set to perform for their Teen of Limbs tour at the Downsview Park in Toronto, Canada. During the setup, however, the stage suddenly collapsed, and with it took the life of drum technician Scott Johnson at just 33 years old. The experience was immensely morose for the band, who were so distraught by it that they were considering abandoning touring altogether. Despite that, however, they decided to carry on with the tour, and following a break spanning a couple of weeks, they returned for a show in France with an encore performance of Reckoner dedicated to Scott. Phil's solo album, Weather House, as well as A Moon-Shaped Pool, both contain dedications to Scott in their liner notes. Additionally, a CBC broadcast from November 2017 showcases Phil meeting up with the parents of Scott, which you can view on the Radiohead Interviews Archive YouTube channel. In June 2013, the Ontario Ministry of Labour took to court with Live Nation, scaffolding company Optech Staging, and stage designer Dominic Cugliari for 13 charges under Ontario's health and safety laws. Unfortunately, the case was dropped in May 2018 under Jordan ruling, much to the detriment of Scott's family and the band. Radiohead would issue a statement on Twitter the next year urging those responsible to admit their part in the accident. A year after that, in November 2020, a professional misconduct hearing was held toward Dominic Cugliari. In another statement from the band on Instagram, Cugliari had officially acknowledged a catalog of errors and negligence on his part, although the admissions were eight years too late, as Cugliari had retired and was beyond any legal recrimination, meaning no justice was placed on behalf of those responsible for the death of Scott Johnson. Motion Picture Soundtrack in Memory of Mackenzie May refers to a YouTube video uploaded by Anthony Packwood on May 25, 2016. The video contains 26 members of the Calgary Stampede show band performing an instrumental rendition of Motion Picture Soundtrack as tribute to Mackenzie May, who had unfortunately passed away earlier in 2015. At around 2 minutes and 6 seconds into the video, the band transforms the second verse of the song into an extremely powerful crescendo. Crushingly, the silence following it is broken up by faint whimpers and sobs. To diverge a bit, I almost viewed it as tasteless to discuss this given the juvenile tone of the rest of this iceberg video, which is why I initially subjugated it as a text-only blip in the original upload, but in the years since then I've grown to feel this performance is deserving of a much more direct acknowledgement regardless. It's heart-wrenching to witness, yet comforting to know that such a beautiful tribute was ever made in the first place. During a radio session for the CBC, Tom York, in conjunction with the band The Posies, performed a cover of Oasis's Wonderwall. It's a cover done entirely in jest, as it doesn't even reach past the first verse of the song, and Tom is obviously taking the piss throughout the entire thing. He even changes the lyrics to, There are many ways that I would like to sing to you, but I don't know how to mock them. There are many ways that I would like to sing to you, but I don't know how. I also just love how Radiohead were among the first to break into the Anyway, Here's Wonderwall meme. Yeah, okay. It's always good to make fun of a way to so. They don't mind it. I mean, we could just do it. Let's, let's play along with you on, yeah. on one of your songs, man. Mm -hmm. Do you have a drummer? Um, I can play drums. We could try.
On the Kid A song Idiot Tech, which was released in 2000, Tom can be heard singing the phrase, Ice Age Coming, Ice Age Coming. Fans didn't think much of it at the time as it was presumably one of the many nonsensical lyrics pulled out of a hat that had no political weight to them in any meaningful way whatsoever. Shockingly, two years later the animated movie Ice Age produced by Blue Sky Studios was released into theaters. Tom tried to warn us of this event but nobody batted an eye and the world coldly suffered for it. Tom explained that the lyrics to Black Star are about sex in the morning. It's the best time to have it, especially if you've brushed your teeth before. I've never heard of this sex thing before, so we're just going to go ahead and move along here. As noted from Idiot Tech, Radiohead were no strangers to sampling, especially during the Kid Amnesiac sessions. Amnesiac actually contains three samples that would go on to be uncredited. In Like Spinning Plates, you can hear a sample of the Isaac Hayes song Windows of the World at about 47 seconds in. In Kinetic, a sample drum loop from Miles Davis's Miles Runs the Voodoo Town plays throughout the song starting at 21 seconds in. This last one is more of an interpolation rather than a straight sample, but the song Hunting Bears highly resembles the Brian Eno track Zowie Nula Lava. It's been over 20 years since the album's release and I know damn well at least Brian Eno has heard Amnesiac so I believe he just doesn't care too much about the interpolation. In fact, Hunting Bears isn't even the only Eno song to resemble a Radiohead track. His song Not Yet Remembered sounds pretty similar to Videotape. Whether or not you truly want to consider these plagiarisms is up to you, but the similarities are undeniable. For me, I see them being done as tribute rather than just to rip something off. As for the samples, they're so minor that it's pretty hard to notice them unless they're pointed out. I imagine that's the reason why they slipped past label executives so easily. Whatever Happens is an unreleased track with lyrics that appear dating back to Kid A's hidden booklet. Something that always fascinated me about this unreleased track in particular is that while there's no audio of what it sounded like, the song actually appeared on the band's website with full lyrics and chords. Given this, I always thought it would be really cool to hear fan interpretations to what the song might have sounded like. Apparently after writing this, I found out that back in the day Radiohead form At Ease actually did this exact thing. I don't have any snippets of their takes unfortunately, but if you're watching this and you have some archived, please let me know. Now this is something I doubt any of you have heard about before, even the more prestige Radiohead fans watching this. I was looking for this one rant video I saw years ago where this kid kept referring to Tom as Tom Yorkie, but instead I came across this insane video of a guy impersonating Tom York struggling to open a pack of razor blades because his hands were shoes. I'm a... Uh, Tom York for Radiohead. I've got... Very... Shoes as hands. I kind of get these very razor blades working. I get very five three. I honestly love this video, and I think it goes down easily as one of the best interviews that Tom has ever done. If you haven't heard of him before. Lemmy is a comedian and Twitch streamer who's gained quite a bit of notoriety with Radiohead fans for bearing a striking resemblance to that one creep guy. I know earlier I talked about Tom York having a brother named Andy who also had his own take on a music career, but I lied about all of that. It was actually just Lemmy. On the cover art of the Airbag EP, there appears the numbers 142614 beneath the title of the EP. This isn't just any random strings of numbers, however. In fact, it's actually a phone number to Tom's old pager. Upon ringing the number up, there would be a pre-recorded snippet of Tom saying hello. Apparently the band had listened to the messages that callers would leave, but had no intentions of doing anything with the recordings. Some guy on Reddit has stated that apparently Radiohead's modified bear logo has the name of Bluku Uktan, 
which I most likely mispronounced. I'd never heard of this before, so I decided to message the user to see if I could get more information about it. And this is what he had to say. I can't find any info either. Just usernames Bluetooth Utan or Bluetooth Utan on Radiohead forums. If I recall correctly, it was the file name of a modified bear image on one of the Radiohead or early websites Bluetoothutan.jpg or something similar, but they kept changing the design of the site on this era, and neither Tom or Stanley confirmed it on an interview but I can't find it. This was info from decades ago and I'm puzzled there's no info. If you're watching this and you have any information at all about Bluetoothutan, please let us know. The success of Creep brought Radiohead into all new territories, allowing them to explore all sorts of landmarks in the world and make fond memories with the locals. Perhaps a memory they're never going to forget is when they first played at Mexico in 1994. The band was brought in by Camilo Lara, who was looking for English talent to tour over in Mexico. He talked with EMI who decided to bring over Radiohead, an up-and-coming band at the time, as a test guinea pig of sorts for the project. Shortly after the band got there, they decided to stop by an OXO, which is like a grocery store that's popular in Mexico. While they were buying their things, a nice man with a giant very machete stopped by to say, A ver hijos de su madre, denme todo lo que tengan ahora mismo. Needless to say, the band obliged and lied their things out on the floor. Mr. Machete then told the band to get on the floor and count to 100 while he evacuated. After brushing upon death, the band headed out to Ojo de Agua to play their first show. Things went well for them there and they were excited to fly out to Guadalajara to play another show the following day. Things were initially doing well upon the flight going off, but since it's Radiohead playing at Mexico in 1994, disaster was bound to strike at any moment. All of a sudden the plane malfunctions and everyone had to put on oxygen masks. Camila Lara and the band were certain with the thoughts that this was where they died, but miraculously, the plane just flew low and managed to truck all the way to Guadalajara. After getting robbed and being in a plane that almost crashed, the group were in high hopes that possibly maybe sh just couldn't get worse in Guadalajara. But it did. The organizers of the show picked the band up in a truck to take them to a venue, and everyone was in high hopes up until the driver said, the brakes aren't working. Since the band didn't speak Spanish, they responded by not responding and continuing to laugh and have a jolly good time. Eventually the driver started screaming, as the truck was going at a high speed and about to crash. He managed to turn the wheel and crash the truck right next to a pole. Everyone got off shaking, and ended up taking a taxi the rest of the way. They played their show in Guadalajara and things went well for them again. Afterwards, they flew back to Mexico City, wary of the plane having problems again, but thankfully it didn't. Upon their arrival, Camilo proposed to bring the band to his studio and record something, so they packed into his truck and went off. Then they got a flat tire, and hung out on the side of the road struggling to change it because nobody knew how to do it properly. The following day they played their final show in the country at Mexico City. Suffice to say, the show went horribly. It took place in a dining room, with waiters screaming and the audience ignoring the performance to eat. Tom ended up getting so upset that he threw a chair. Camilo described the concert as probably the saddest thing Radiohead did in their career. After the show he took the band to a bar with and said he couldn't say more about their experience. Camilo Lara detailed this experience in an interview with Vice in a video titled Así fue la primera y casi última gira de Radiohead en México. Which roughly translates to this was Radiohead's first and almost last tour in Mexico. Since I don't speak Spanish, I had to go off of a translation done by Kid A Rob to the th on Reddit. So major props to them for translating it. As for the entire experience, it's very insane to say the least. After getting robbed, nearly getting in a plane crash, getting a flat tire, and playing a show that rivals the OK Computer Tour in terms of misery, I'm really shocked that this isn't as well known. Since the initial upload, you guys have informed me on a few key details I didn't include that I'd like to make mention of real quick. Apparently a company called had the intention to do a documentary on the gig, but was cancelled for unknown reasons. Clips of the song they played were lost for a while, but fortunately found a way onto YouTube. Also, after all they experienced with that gig, they considered disbanding on the roof of a senora's house. Thankfully though, that didn't happen, and allegedly after the guys got into a huge argument it kickstarted a healing and overall better atmosphere in the group, which fortunately gave us way to some very good music later on. 
Lastly, from a Reddit thread that discussed the Mexico 1994 incident, user Dark Dex informed of Waste Newsletter number 8, where Colin discusses a plane crash in Mexico, stating, At the end of the tour, myself, Tom, Johnny, and Ed flew to Miami, leaving Phil and the crew to return to England. As their plane was about to take off from Mexico City Airport, two women on board started freaking out, saying that something bad was going to happen to the plane and insisted on getting off. After an hour's delay, the plane took off. Four hours later, over America, the captain announced that there was a fire on board, shut down two of the four engines. When our guitar tech, Duncan Swift, was woken and told we've lost two engines, he merely sighed, remarked how careless, and returned to his slumbers. When he next woke, the plane was on a Boston runway surrounded by fire trucks and ambulances. Turns out that there was no fire. A batch of badly packed vegetables in the hold had given off fumes which set off the alarms. And that about covers this entire Radiohead iceberg. It was a big one to say the least, and if you've made it this far, then I sincerely want to thank you for watching through the entire thing. If I had to throw out a guess, I'd assume that me talking about Radiohead is something that's up your alley, so I'd just like to let you know that I have even more videos out covering the band currently, with many more to come in the future. Kid A CD Secrets especially is pretty much a direct continuation of this one, getting into stuff like the hidden booklet, hidden track, and a certain conspiracy that I may or may not have glossed over in this video. Later this month, though, you can also expect me to take a closer look into the comparisons revolving around Radiohead and Coldplay and Muse. That one I feel like is gonna be a lot of fun to go through. I know that my output has been less than stellar this past year, but I'm happy to let you guys know that things have eased up a bit in my personal life, and I'm now able to dedicate way more time to making videos. Currently I'm shooting for at least one upload a month, but ideally I'm striving to put out even more. I've got tons of ideas for this channel, lots involving Radiohead, and some that don't, but I'm certain that they're all going to be a lot of fun to watch through, so stay tuned for the months to come. Thanks again for watching this video, and I'll see you all in the next one.